Hello and welcome to Buildings of Tomorrow. My name is John Lester and in today's episode we'll be talking about the four pillars of healthy and productive rooms. I'm joined today by Jonathan Copley, a Marketing Manager for Room Automation at Siemens Smart Infrastructure. Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's great to be here, John. Room automation, we've talked a little bit about what this is and this, this trend of looking now at how rooms can, can help us as users be more healthy and more productive. And you mentioned the four pillars of healthy and productive rooms. Could you give us more detail on what these are? Yes, John. What we're looking at here is four parameters that you really need to consider if you want to create a healthy and productive room. So these are four, pillar, uh, four parameters within the environmental space, the air and the temperature and these sorts of things. Exactly. Of course, everyone knows you need to control temperature yeah. to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. But the, the four others that are really significant are CO2, carbon dioxide, yep. uh, VOCs. These are volatile organic compounds, mm -hmm. poisons that you often find in the air inside buildings. Then we have humidity and... Finally, PM 2.5 fine dust. This is air pollution. Okay, so these are our four pillars. Let's run through them one at a time. Let's start with the healthy aspect of it. And you mentioned just then uh, PM 2.5 or fine dust. This is something that we hear a lot about, in the, particularly in the media at the moment, in, in major city centres. Can you give us some details on what this is and how it affects our, our health within the room? Yes, I think when people consider this fine dust air pollution, they often have in their mind an image of somebody in China going to work on a bicycle or on foot with a mask, a face mask, uh, perhaps unable to see their hand in front of their face. So much smog. Terrible smog. Yeah. And of course, this is a huge concern, not only for people living in, in uh, China, but for uh, companies that want their employees to go from Europe or America to work there too. You read about this almost every day in the newspapers. Uh, this is a, a very common media topic these days, partly driven, of course, by Volkswagen and the big drama that they had over recent years. But this, of course, is a much more widespread problem. These fine dust particles, they come from burning, essentially. So they come from cars, but not only that, also power stations Industry. and many other sources. Okay, so it's not just a problem in some of the places we've seen in the, the, the video or the, the pictures of the really significant issues, but every major city has, has a, a concern at least with this issue. Yes, indeed. Uh, it's not just Asia that has this problem. What we find is that the major cities in Europe and the Americas, they have levels of PM 2.5 fine dust which can be two, three, four or more times higher than the maximum level that's recommended by the World Health Authority. Okay, and if we exceed those levels, what, what are some of the effects? What's an overview of what these, these PM2.5 particles can do? Okay, well, there are, of course, particles of many different sizes in, in air pollution. The bigger particles, they get uh, stuck in your throat uh, or, or your mouth, they don't go down. Uh, but these very fine particles, they go into your lungs uh, through the alveoli into your blood and they cause not only lung disease but also heart disease. It's been found these tiny particles, they also go into the brain. There's some research suggesting that it reduces your intelligence if you live in a city with a very high level of fine dust air pollution. And they, have go, they go also into, uh, into the fetus. If a woman is pregnant, uh, this, this can also be a concern. So some really serious implications if this isn't controlled properly. This is very bad stuff. And uh, actually in some countries, for example, in Inti India, they're finding the level of of lung cancer is rocketing in young people in their 30s, and this has not been seen before. Okay, so there's fine dust, uh, PM 2.5 particles. How about humidity? Humidity is one that's uh, also very interesting. Uh, people are aware that high humidity makes you uncomfortable. If, if you've been on holiday in a hotel that's very humid or walking outside, uh, you're aware of the impact on your comfort. But what most people don't realize is the impact of humidity on your health. 
if you have very dry air, of course, it can affect uh, your skin, your eyes, uh, might make it more difficult for you to read your computer screen if your eyes are very dry. Um, also, it affects uh, your, your well-being. A lot of people complain about very dry air, but it goes much more uh, it goes much more deeply than this because a lot of recent research has shown that the level of humidity in a room can also affect the rate of virus transmission. And this means colds and flu. I'm sure you, John, have been in a building with all your colleagues around you coughing and sneezing, and then perhaps at some point you also go down with it. Humidity can have an impact on this, and what we find is that at very high levels of humidity, uh, the viruses are very happy. They come in droplets they out survive. of your mouth, they yeah. survive. Okay. Um, at medium levels of humidity, uh, they actually are deactivated for reasons I won't go into right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but with dry air, there you have the worst problem because mm -hmm. the viruses, they, they're happy, they stay active, and because the particles are in dry air, the, the liquid particles, there's a lot of evaporation. They get smaller and smaller and smaller. So these liquid particles with viruses, further, yeah. they travel further, they stay in aerosol yeah, yeah. Okay. and uh, increase the probability that you will catch a virus, John. So low humidity, the, the worst as far as virus transmission goes, but high humidity also not good. So this, this perfect little medium zone of 40 to 60% is where we want to be. That's exactly right. And okay. you can do that with uh, humidifiers and dehumidifiers to control into, into that mm, ideal range. Now you mentioned uh, VOCs or uh, is it volatile, volatile organic, organic compounds. compounds? Okay, and what is this? What are we talking about? Yes, well, these are chemicals. They're volatile chemicals, so they evaporate quickly into the air, uh, and they are, in one way or another, poisonous. Most people don't realize where they come from. Uh, they are derived from paints, also from cheap furniture and carpets. They come from cleaning materials and from office equipment, from many sources. And what we find is that the levels of these VOCs is typically much higher indoors than outdoors. So you really need to think about controlling them. So this is that sometimes you're in a new office or a new car and you have that fumey smell that could, could give you a headache or... or or sore throat, or just gen generally make you feel unwell. <laughs> and this is what we find also in offices with sick building syndrome. People feel unwell, they can't explain why, mm -hmm. but they are absent um, or not performing because of these poisons that they're okay. um, breathing in. Beautiful. So that's three of our pillars. And the last pillar we have is, is carbon dioxide. How does this affect our day-to-day -day life inside a building? Well, I'm sure many times, John, you have been, let's say, in a meeting room, perhaps after lunch, and you find your eyes flickering, maybe you're even drifting in and out of sleep, perhaps or because in sleep, yeah, think. perhaps because it's a rather dull presentation, but more likely it's because the CO2 levels are just far too high. Mm -hmm. Fresh air is around 400 parts per million. Anything up to about a thousand parts per million is good, but we often see in offices, also in schools, levels of uh, 2,000, 3,000, sometimes even 4,000 and above. And when you reach these levels above 2,000, your performance can drop by 90%. There's a lot of recent uh, research looking at the impact of CO2 on people's ability to make decisions, yeah. to use data effectively, or even just to stay awake, of course. 90%. That's, That's a, a huge, huge impact. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, you mentioned that fresh air is around 400. So this, for us, controlling the room is all about uh, understanding the levels and bringing in the right amount of fresh air to control those situations. Yeah, I ideally, what you would do is control all four pillars. You'd have sensors that monitor the levels of CO2, VOC, uh, humidity and fine dust, and then adjust the climate accordingly to make sure that the occupants of the building are as productive as possible, uh, that they are as absent uh, because they're sick, as little as possible, and that they are healthy long term. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you all for joining us here on Buildings of Tomorrow. Please feel free to like, share and comment on this episode and also subscribe to us here on this channel. We'll see you again soon.